So just when we thought it was safe to go back in the water, you remember that? That was the Jaws movie. Um, I'm going to re refer to another movie too, The Graduate. You remember the pool scene where he said, I've got one word for you, plastics. So what do those two movies and what does that quote have to do with anything? You know, again, just when we thought we were getting safe from heart attacks, now we start hearing about plastics. In the past, we thought it was cholesterol. Then we said, oh, no, no, it's got to be bad cholesterol, LDL. And then the lipidologists more recently have said, well, it's not really just LDL. There's metabolic issues going on, and that's really better reflected by looking at a thing called ApoB, because that includes VLDL or remnant cholesterol. Now, <clears throat> I think through all of this, nobody has had much argument that smoking really does cause heart attacks, uh, except, again, 50 years ago, there were commercials where Physicians were recommending smoking. Uh, what do we do about all this? Well, um, we would come in and say, yep, we're glad that uh, the, the lipidologists recently started talking about uh, ApoB. At least they're acknowledging that insulin resistance, prediabetes, metabolic disease is an issue. And in our mind, and when we, you look at the evidence, I think you'll agree. It's the biggest issue on a population basis right now. If you, have, if you are a smoker, if you do have rheumatoid arthritis, yes, those are as big a risk for you as an individual as diabetes and prediabetes. But now we've got this new thing, this microplastics, nanoplastics. What in the heck is going on with that? How big of a risk is it? Uh, and even if it is real, if, even if it is a risk, what in the heck can we do about that? If you've been um, hiding under a rock, maybe you haven't seen anything about this, but if you haven't been hiding under a rock, uh, there's a lot of question right now about the role of plastics. How big are they? How much of a risk? What type of plastics? How do we get exposed to them? And what do you do about it? So we're going to talk about what news is out there and how to deal with that news. Um, there's several different pieces to it. One has to do with pollution. One has to do with the use of plastics in, uh, in foods, food preparation. And in fact, one of the questions that an, a recent uh, YouTube content creator brought up is, well, actually, are these plastics a, an indicator of somebody basically eating a lot of processed food? Because that's what the processed food is, is wrapped in. So let's go back and talk about what's really there. And then we can talk about the projections, the questions that might surround this. There was an Italian group of researchers. They identified people with microplastics in their plaque. In other words, they were doing carotid endarterectomies, taking the plaque out of the carotid artery in the neck. It's stuff that they were doing anyway. So they said, hey, let's take a look at the plaque that we're seeing in these people when we take it out. And then let's follow these people for heart attacks and strokes in the future. So they did. They took a look at these folks. They took the, the plaque out just like they were doing, regular, their regular process for medicine and their hope for preventing strokes. And then they analyzed those plaques to see, do they have microplastics in them? And then they followed those patients for heart attacks and strokes in the future. Now, I'm not going to tell you what happened. Jesus is going to talk to you a little bit more about that. Um, but just remember, once we finish covering this, uh, this sp specific piece of research, this specific piece of evidence, as usual, every Wednesday, we'll cover your questions. Thanks again for joining us. Jesus? Hey, good morning, everyone. It's good to have you here. And we have Ginny right here as well. Um, 
Yeah. We're trying to learn how to use this thing. Give me one minute. Uh, <laughs> uh, I might not be able to be on the screen today, so we have to. Oh, yeah. Let's do it that way. <laughs> so uh, this is the research for you today, for you to see. Uh, microplastics and nanoplastics. This is an article that was posted a few months back. Uh, last month, actually. And we, you now, I'm, I'm, I'm always uh, behind Dr. Brewer and telling him, hey, we're getting late to the party. A lot of people already <laughs> talked about <laughs> this. Is, the it, truth. is this still a popular topic? But I want you to know our, our uh, insight on this topic and what to do about it. And it was, is this really a cause of heart disease? Or it's just like the title said, yet another risk factor to consider. So what they did is that they run a prospective multicenter observational study. Basically, they followed these people from the very beginning. They knew that they were going to do this procedure, Dr. Brewer described as taking out the plaque from the artery on the neck of these people. So they said, we're already going to do that. Let's just go ahead and check out the plaque and see if there's anything special on that plaque that might be related to anything. And that's how they find out that. So the initial study wasn't necessarily expecting to find microplastic. That was a finding, and they just grabbed that and said, well, we need to publish this. Uh, the study is, isn't, isn't small, but still, 300 patients is not that big either. But the, the value of this study is that nobody has done this before. So since nobody has done this before, this is a, a new thing that we wanted to explore and we wanted to know more about. I'm going to jump here real quick, and then I'm going to go back to that part. Um, what they found was two specific types of plastics. So 150, like 58% of people, have one of the plastics called polyethylene. And 12% of people have polyvinyl, polyvinyl chloride, uh, which is your traditional PVC. And it's interesting that the plastic itself was specifically not only on plaque alone, but it was inside the macrophages those cells that bite off kind of uh, the debris or all that trash that is not supposed to be on, on a place, in this case, black. And the implication that the macrophages are eating that plastic is that this plastic alone is causing inflammation because it's triggering the response from the immune systems to bite it, to eat it, and try to, to take it out. Now, as you might find, uh, you, might, you might probably guess, the body is not equipped to digest or eliminate all these plastics on a 100% basis. So there is also some pieces of plastic uh, on, on other places around those macrophages causing problem. So very big deal because even though this is not cause and effect related specifically just because of the design of the study, the fact that we see immune cells trying to eat this plastic, it means that it's triggering an inflammation response. So what they found is that those patients, those one, 150 patients who had plastics on them, if after they followed them up for uh, 34 months, more than two years, almost three years, they have 4.5 higher risk of developing heart attack strokes or death from any cause. Even if they took plaque out of their necks, and this, this comes back to the point of both strokes and um, especially ischemic strokes, uh, which are the ones that are, are related to plaque. And uh, heart attacks are an inflammatory issue, a cardiovascular inflammation issue. And you can see that. You can take out the plaque on your neck and still have a risk of developing heart attack and stroke, especially if you had plastics, according to these results on this research. We have some limitations. So one limitation that the authors mentioned was possible lab contamination. I mean, how much, how impactful that is, we're not sure. But the study was not developed to assess microplastics. So that was a finding. And they did not prepare the lab in a way that they would not be contaminated with plastics on it. They had no further socioeconomic data. So they don't they they were not able to differentiate other factors that could be involved with higher cardiovascular risk. And especially they, there was no consideration about food or drinking water. So they didn't know how the patients were eating because the idea of the study wasn't that at the beginning. So they did not collect that information. So that points limitations on being able to say, hey, microplastics alone are 
causing heart disease or causing heart attacks. We don't know for sure, but it's it's uh, it's an interesting finding to say the least. So Dr. Brewer spoiled the beans at the beginning, and he started with the twist and what we were going to say. And uh, I went on to reading the research, doing a little bit background research, and that also includes watching another other other YouTube uh, content creators on this topic. I was impressed to see that only a couple of them acknowledged this, which is what Dr. Bruce said at the beginning. Maybe the people who has a lot of exposure to microplastics are people who are eating a lot of processed foods that comes on plastic envelopes and plastic containers. They're heating them on the microwave with all the plastic on it. The food itself can absorb a lot of that. If I mean, if you eat a bag of potato chips, uh, now we're make, uh, we're a little bit more aware that it's not just the saturated fats, if you want to see that, and especially the carbohydrates on those and uh, the other chemical substance that they put on those things, plus the microplastics that get absorbed from the bag itself. And maybe that's, that's the problem. And this is a, a little bit more clear perspective. If you eat a lot of processed foods, yes, your, your cardiovascular risk is going to go through the roof. And we can add microplastics to that um, mix, just just like that. Uh, before we go to some recommendations on how to decrease your exposure to microplastics, because even though if the research is not showing cause and effect, still, I see pollution as kind of an um, evolutionary problem for the humankind, because we're getting more reliant on technology and all this dispense containers on plastics and there's plastic everywhere. And if we're no longer dying mostly from infections that we used to do a hundred years ago, we're now dying because of pollution. And this is just one small piece of that, not considering air pollution, just talking about microplastics alone, which are in the air, are on our food, are on everybody, uh, on everywhere, better said. So, Dr. Brewer, Jeannie, do you have any takes on that before we go to how to maybe decrease your microplastic exposure? Well, it's interesting that um, they were able to pull the plaque and see that, I guess. That's really interesting to me, but concerning because so many things are in plastic now. And I was even reading some of the comments talking about lids on coffee cups and everything else. So I guess it's another level of awareness, right? Well, and it's a scary. And I mean, Dr. Brewer and I have some background on toxicology and we kind of, uh, you, you, when you get those glasses, you kind of know already the soil might be contaminated. So even the food that's coming out from the soil might have some contamination in it. And it's really hard to just go ahead and al analyze all, all the food and all the food sources to make sure that they're not contaminated. Yeah. The process where foods itself are done, even if they're they're quote unquote organic, there's a risk in them. Of course, the risk will be uh, a lot less compared to processed foods. Sure. Doctor Burr is more uh, busy answering questions from non YouTube <laughs> members. Uh, do, do you want? Do you want, do. <clears throat> do you want to contribute a little bit, Doctor Burr? Do you have? An, we haven't discussed this. Just so you know, we haven't discussed this off camera just yet. So I don't know Doctor Burr's perspective on the topic. So actually, I'm not some I, I, I did answer a couple of non-member questions, but I'm actually making some notes about obesogens and pollution. You remember our uh, interview with our, with our friend Robert Lustig and his recent uh, the article about the four mechanisms of obesity. You know, one is uh, energy balance method. Another, another is the carbohydrate uh, insulin model, but then he's talking about obesogens. Uh, what was the big one in Silent Spring? Not Polluted, sure. Huh? Was Not it sure. Was it DDT? But again... Uh, or maybe PFAS, wasn't it? Or P, Well, and, and we know that we've got a lot of obesogens in things like um, coatings, mm -hmm. uh, nonstick coatings. And so, yeah. Cosmetics. Got, Cosmetics is a big one, too. Cosmetics. Now they talked about cosmetics as a as a big potential source for plastics here, and then they they backed off a little bit and said, well, maybe not so much. But again, especially with lipstick, 
So I think I see one of the three of us has lipstick on today. <laughs> do you like it? Do you, do you, do you know if you have any uh, microplastics in that lipstick? I, I don't, but I um, was talking to one of our other doctors and she was talking about using all this stuff with nothing in it. And it's very hard. And I've been doing research um, and they say mineral based is safer, but some mineral based has this. So if you have any recommendations, we're all in here. You know, uh, the major recommendation I have is it's hard being a woman, you know, men, it, it's so easy being a, just a dumb old man. We just get to focus on, on our work. Women have to take care of the family and, and work as well. And then you have to focus on looking good. And it's like, dang, all of that. And then you got to stay healthy on top of it. Right. So anyhow, that's another, another rant about another bunny hole. The other comment I was making, Jesus, was inflammation. You know, uh, Kofi from, uh, where was it in, in Africa? I believe Ghana? it's Ghana. Yeah. Kofi from Ghana was saying, well, what's in plaque anyway? And I was saying, Kofi, you know what? Uh, if you call US 859-721-1414, uh, we'll give you a free copy of the, of the plaque course. We actually ha have a lot of photo micrographs, uh, electron micrographs of plaque. And... Most plaque, yes, as I mean, it, there's a long history on this issue of what is in plaque. Uh, in the beginning, they they started to see fats in it way back in the uh, gosh, the Middle Ages, and they said, well, uh, it's fat that's causing it, so don't eat fat. Well, then they got a little bit little bit clearer on it and did some chemical analysis and started to realize, well, it's actually there's a lot of cholesterol in there. L small LDL particles as you as we are beginning to find out these days. So again, you start going down that path of saying, well, if it's uh, cholesterol, then we shouldn't eat eggs because eggs are our big source of cholesterol. And then we figured out, I mean, then this was what 30 years ago we figured out, well, Maybe it's not eggs because our body makes a lot more cholesterol than we ever eat in an egg anyway. So we continue to stumble through the darkness in terms of trying to figure out what's going on. Uh, Jesus brought up a really good point that um, that I, the 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 article the, the article in the New England Journal didn't really talk that much about, and that is uh, maybe there's a significant role for, for inflammation here. Because, again, the polymorphs, the macrophages, the different immune cells that are responsible for cleaning up and then stabilizing plaque can't ever get wrap their head around their lysosome around that nanoparticle, that plastic nanoparticle. They can't kill it. So they, you, you just keep on with the inflammation, inflammation, inflammation. And you begin to wonder, well, you know, maybe that's part of the process. So, um, again, there's a lot of questions that, that come up as you begin to think through this. So if yeah. someone stops and they have a history of, <clears throat> of, you know, having eaten a lot of processed stuff and they stop, how, how will that clear out? Will eventually the macrophage just get it out of there or no? We don't know. Well, that's the problem. We don't know. And thank you to old Roscoe. He did say it's, it was DDT, Silent Spring, Rachel Carlson. So um, I think I think that part of um, <laughs> what what do you do when toxic in toxicology? What do you do? It's like you kind of have your hands tied down, and it's like the exposure is everywhere. And being able to decrease your exposure to close to zero, it's almost impossible. Uh, even if you go live to the woods, I mean, uh, <laughs> we have done a really good job killing the planet. So, uh, but there's some there's still some stuff that you can do. To decrease that risk. Uh, before we move there, I'm gonna do something that a lot of people hate, but uh, I have to do it, and uh, the team appreciates me doing that that part. So um, I'll ask you to bear with me for just one moment. We are very excited about our event on Dallas, April the 18th to the 20th. Uh, it's coming up in a few weeks now. Uh, as far as I know, we have like less than eight spots already right there. So we're almost sold out. That's that's good. Uh, we no longer have an early bird rate, but still you might be able to go there and uh, enjoy the meeting, met Dr. Brewer, 
and more importantly, get life-saving information that you will, will not get elsewhere. We have made some changes compared to our Tampa event, where this time we're focusing it more on to practical recommendations, similar to what we're going to tell you right now about how to reduce microplastic exposure, but in regards to overall cardiovascular prevention. We'll have Jeannie, Heather, Dr. Brewer, myself in there, and uh, you can enjoy a little bit of the banter that we, Dr. Brewer and I just do, uh, usually do on YouTube as well. Uh, Dr. Brewer, do you want to say something about the event before uh, we move on? Yes, thank you. So, um, again, we you hear people call it a forum, a summit, all these different things where it makes you think about, okay, I go down there and I sit on my backside and listen to people talk for hour after hour after hour. And that's not that's not what this is. I mean, you do get some of that, but really you get a, a way to evaluate your metabolic disease. Uh, when you sign up for the event, you get a set of orders, lab orders, and um, you can get your lab orders, come down, review them uh, as part of the event itself. So uh, even you can say, well, I could get that uh, much more easily if I just did the um, the telemedicine uh, activity. And yes, that's true. You get it much more easily. But again, you also get what you pay for. Uh, if you invest, it's one thing to get an, uh, an hour or, or a couple of hours over the internet uh, of review of your cases. It's a totally different experience to sit with 50 people who um, they've done the same thing. They've got this. And you now begin to look through our eyes. You begin to see just how unusual is an LDL of 180. And what does it mean when, the, uh, when your triglyceride over H uh, DL is, is five, or what does it mean when it's one and how common is that? And how much, uh, how much risk do I really have compared to somebody in my own demographic? So you really get a totally different experience when you do it. That's Thank you, what Dr. I would Brewer. say. Very Thank good. you, Dr. Brewer. Yeah, go ahead, Jenny. No, very good. He said it all. All right. <laughs> so okay, let, let, let's go to the next part, uh, which is what, what the people are here about. Um, so what to do about reducing microplastics and a, a lot of, there's no, there's nothing set in stone. This is coming from different multiple sources. Um, I, I, as we mentioned, it's kind of impossible to reduce your exposure down to zero. But if we start by the word you are using uh, clothes, preferring cotton or wool over other type of process, especially polyethylene, as you saw one of the plastics that is uh, more, more involved in this problem, that's a good idea. Um, the problem with these particles is they're just too tiny, too small. Micro, microplastics and nanoplastics are just too small and it's really very, very easy to inhale them on your breath and then they go through your uh, bloodstream and end up in your heart. So that's the big issue. Using water filters, uh, both for uh, for drinking water and for all uh, overall water that you used, because there is a there is a perspective where probably contaminated water might mix with clothes as well, and then you you're using cotton clothes, but they're still contaminated with plastics coming from water. Avoiding bottled water, plastic bottles of water, that's a big one as well. And even avoiding dryers, using dryers and just uh, drying on uh, on the outside instead of using that. That's kind of the recommendations that are available. Avoiding single-use plastics, that's bottled waters and other types of plastics in that. And avoiding plastic or using plastic-free cosmetics, especially PFAS, avoiding PFAS on cosmetics and toothbrushes. Uh, but again, it's, it's hard uh, even finding those, but those considerations. And the one that is causing a little bit more of the conflict is... Reducing fish consumption, especially shellfish, um, because if if there's one place where you will have a, will find a lot of microplastics, that's that's the ocean, and this there's plenty of evidence, there's plenty of research that a lot of people are very concerned about mercury, but I think there there even there's even more microplastics than mercury on fish. Uh, I don't know, Doctor Brewer and Jeannie, are you gonna stop eating seafood? Probably, I'm I'm not but uh, I'll be a little bit more conscious about it. 
are shellfish more of a filter? Is that why they're filtering out stuff and they're there? I mean, because I know like they absorb whatever they're in, you know, well, crawfish and shrimp. Apparently, shellfish are worse mm -hmm. than than your usual salmon or herring. And I, I think you're right, Jenny. I think it's because they sit there and their role in the in the aquatic system ecosystem is to filter water. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It seems like we should have a filter that we could pull out and clean and put back, Dr. Burr. Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> right. That's that's dialysis, but I would not like right. I would not like to have that. Uh, you're, no you're one one that you could just remove, you know, that you don't have <laughs> oh, to yeah. leave, you stay on or use yeah. for your kidneys but yeah yeah and well uh, an, another one that is easy and an easy fix is do not microwave in plastic if you're doing that and vacuum carpets or you can even get one of those fancy Roombas and uh, just trying to avoid uh, all that amount of problems um i don't have so a carpet though so that's not a problem for me so you're but saying I know you should there's a lot of carpets yeah people shouldn't shouldn't vacuum is that what you're saying oh yeah they, they should vacuum <laughs> Okay. I probably I probably avoid using carpets. I know I know how, how cool those are, but there's a big it is a big deal with carpets, especially people with asthma and stuff. Uh, we because of what they're made of. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Okay. All right. So that's that's the show for for today. So any closing remarks on this one, Dr. Brewer? You know, it's just like Jaws, right? When you thought it was safe to go back in the water. Well, I I think I think this is this is this is new because it's just recently published. But we somehow were blessed with ignorance before this, you know? Like <laughs> you know, the other thing and, and we did talk a little bit about this. Um uh, one reaction is to say, yeah, there's more and more and more and more bad news. Uh and that yeah, all the plastics that we're surrounded with are killing us. Uh, like we discussed earlier, let's take time, take our pulse, think through this, and you begin to see why so many studies end with the statement, more research needs to be done. Every answer creates a whole new set of questions. And yep, th there's an answer here that, yep, if you, if you look for micro and nanoplastics in a clot, at least when these folks did it, or in, in a plaque, you got increased risk. What on earth does it mean? We really have no clue. We have absolutely no clue. It could be anything from a biomarker for eating more processed foods to um, a, a recurring source of inflammation in a plaque to uh, you know, maybe that's a biomarker for obesogens. I don't know that they really clarified anything about that. You would think that they could simply by looking at, you know, uh, uh, looking at obesity uh, and comparing that with this group versus the others. And maybe they did that and I didn't see it. But no, I, I didn't. I didn't see that either. They, I don't think they did it. And, and which which sounds kind of obvious, doesn't it? And even if they had found it, the question would be, well, was it something in the plastics that created the risk for the for that? You know, meaning the obesogens, or was it something else? So again, we got an answer, but we we just got a whole bunch of new questions. Yep. Well, I I think it would be good too if we could maybe look at some of the things, even for makeup that would be recommended even in that because Miranda and I were talking about that and it's very hard to figure that out because the way they word things and everything else. So I guess, Jesus, maybe you could help me figure that out. Well, and, it, and it's uh, also trusting on the companies who develop those. Uh, and by law, they're supposed to tell the truth, right? But mm -hmm. it's only when you start to doing some specific analysis on each product when you find out if that's actually the reality or not. Right. Uh, it sounds to me that you volunteer to do a show on how to choose the right <laughs> cosmetics and other organic products to avoid contamination. So we might want to consider that. I'm going to take your word for it. Okay. Uh, one, one, one concept that you do here, uh, um, again, a lot of people have covered this, as we mentioned earlier on, and I think most of them are saying the same thing. We are totally inundated in our the 
micro environments that humans have created for ourselves, we're totally inundated with exposure to plastics. So it's not like uh, any individual one of us is going to be able to um, uh, to do a huge amount to completely isolate ourselves away from plastic. But there are some things, for example, you know, we've, we've already got comments, people saying, you know what, I don't drink uh, from plastic cups anymore. I don't um, use, uh, uh, I don't buy food that's wrapped in plastic. You know, and there's a bunch of things like that that are that are probably reasonable and maybe a little bit obvious. Uh, Jesus mentioned use of, and others have mentioned use of um, plastic clothing uh, versus uh, versus natural fibers. Mm. You know, the uh, the microfibers are a big deal. They've been a miracle in terms of. Uh, athletic wear, and now you got to go back and say, "Yeah, you know what?" But are they are they giving you a little micro puff of micro and nanoplastics every time you take them out of the closet and put them on? Yep. So <clears throat> there's a lot a, a lot to be thinking about in terms of uh, how do we protect ourselves on a practical basis as individuals. Yep. Well. Uh... Concluding, like the author said, that we need more research, and that takes years, years, years of research. Uh, but there's some stuff that we might be able to solve now. So uh, let's go to Q and A and answer some of the questions from the from the audience. Gilbert. We need to just a shorter intro to the Q and A, Doctor Brewer. Uh, I don't think so. I love it. I think it's fun. But you can you can chop it up a little bit if you want. Just don't get rid of the water ball. No, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna keep the water ball only. I think that's gonna that's gonna happen. There we uh, go. Just a reminder: Dallas, Texas, April the 18th to the 20th. Register today. Few spots available. PrepMedHealthEvents.com or 859-721-1414. Gilbert can put the number up there uh get a chance to discuss more about all the stuff uh probably we'll mention microplastics a little bit but there are other things that we know for sure are killing people and we're going to talk about that and how you can prevent that from happening to you on a practical level so that's the other advice uh, advertisement part Good. Let's Good. questions now yeah. i gotta interrupt and say thank you for pointing that out it's like we're running from microplastics we're running from apob we're running from uh, quote, bad cholesterol. And uh, it's so obvious and so right in front of us that metabolic disease is the major killer and disabler. And what are we doing about that? Eating more uh, Captain Crunch? <laughs> yep. All right. So, I'm sorry, you will not get an answer from me if you're not a YouTube member. You just have to click on the join button next to the subscribe button. Uh, but I mean, if we have a chance, we're gonna get to your questions. I'm just gonna address one of those first. Uh, you see Black Tengu has a small icon next to his name. That's That means that he's a YouTube channel member, not YouTube premium member, but a YouTube channel member. So just click on join and we'll be able to get to your questions first. And uh, that that I mean for for those who are new to the channel, that comes that comes because Dr. Brewer and I try to address as much questions as possible, and we always fail miserably on that. <laughs> so we try to put kind of a something in there to help us out too. So Black Tengu hitting ready males, hitting ready males. Is that males? Meals. That? It's supposed meals. to be meals. Okay, <laughs> thank you. I was like. Is this the correct channel for this? Uh, and plastic is gonna release lots of nanoplastics in the food. Yeah, that that and you know what other other things I learned a long time ago. If you left a bottle of water heat uh, to the sun, exposed to the sun, uh, the water will evaporate within the bottle, but also will release microplastics uh, from 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 the bottle itself. So careful about that. 
Uh, you can measure, you can almost measure anything on your blood. The thing is that a lot of the stuff that you want to measure either A, requires in a specific, um, I'm, I'm blanking on the name for that, um, substance to be able to see on the microscope, depending on the technique you use, or you can put it on a microscope, but you can, you can also, you can measure almost anything. The thing is that a lot of a lot of things are not kind of easily available because they require specific chemicals to do the testing. So there's a lot of blood testing that is exclusive for research uh, because it's just too expensive and labs are not going to do that. Um, I'm not aware of any lab that is measuring plastics on blood uh, traditionally. I don't know. Uh, in case you are aware of that, Dr. Brewer. So it's called, uh, there's a couple of techniques. I think the one they used was double shot pyrolysis. In other words, just burning it and gas chromatography. And yes, you have those available. I haven't seen that uh, used anywhere in terms of um, retail available labs. I may be wrong. I would love for someone to fact check us on that. Um, I just haven't seen that testing available. Yeah, me neither. <clears throat> That's something that your doctor or any doctor overall, it's kind of uh, going to be looking for, especially because one, one, the evidence wasn't there just yet. And two, we're more focused on other stuff that is actually more impactful. But this this kind of uh, research opens the door for all those types of questions about. So should we now start measuring plastics on blood? That's a good point. Uh, that the same question, the same comment about the hitting males. Uh, Dr. Sabine Hassan has found that by fetobacteria, it's microplastics. I'm, I'm pretty sure that it might be. The, the thing is, I don't think we have bifidobacteria on our vessels on plaque. Uh, but it's interesting to see how even nature is starting to develop um, defense mechanisms to deal with, with pollution. Um, PTA and GB mentioned in the silence spray book and DDT. And Rick Folia, if it's in your blood, it's in your plaque, very likely. Chris Linke, got some good news for a change. Three of the past seven days, my waking glucose levels has been under 120, with today's being 98. That's good. Okay. Congratulations. That's a big deal. It is. Rick Folia, I was in the hospital, a lot of plastic tubes and bags. That's true. But one thing to remember, and I don't think we mentioned that, I think all these microplastics come from chronic exposure. So this is not something that's just happening once. So unless you're living on the hospital for six months. But um, what happens about the people in the hospital touching the IV bags for 25 years? Yeah, that, that's that's a good point as well. Yeah, I agree and with all you, the, Jeannie. And all, the st and all the stuff and the packaging, even to open everything, you know, how mm -hmm. much stuff are we touching, the gloves? Uh, yeah. Yep. So again, this brings up a whole new set of questions. We have absolutely no clue where our major exposures to plastics are coming from. Yep. And that's why we were kind of uh, trying to cover all corners. Mm -hmm. Yep. I remember, uh, I remember when the COVID uh, outbreak first started happening and people were talking about how to manage uh, their groceries. Yeah, they were watching them. them. Yeah, because we were all guessing at that point in time. Well, where's the exposure coming from? Well, think about all the <clears throat> I'll think about all the Lysol I used on packages that came <laughs> during that time and breathing of it and feeling like I've just inhaled so much Lysol, you know, because it was like even my my granddaughter would say, um, get the Lysol. And she was four and she was spraying it. And, you know, I was like, you don't touch that bit. But all that stuff you were spraying to try to not get you know, COVID, but now we, who knows what we did to ourselves in the midst of that. Yep. Well, uh, we then find out it was mostly airborne, but still I saw a couple of research saying that contact with surfaces al also provided some risk. And well, that, that's a hard time for recent humankind history. Mm -hmm. uh, I noticed that sometimes my sugar level after going for a while will be higher than my walking, waking level. What would go up with such minimal type of exercise? This is a really good question, Dr. Brewer. Do you have a, do you have a comment on that? Why your blood sugar goes up when you're exercising? Well, 
Uh, usually when you exercise, you get a little bit of a boost of adrenaline or epinephrine. And what does adrenaline or epinephrine do to your liver? It Horses tells you, good. it tells you to, to, uh, cut off some of those, um, glucose, some of those, um, glucose molecules from your, uh, glycogen and put them into the blood. So one of the things that happens is the more the more fat adapted somebody becomes, the more likely they become to uh, to have that process as their major driver for blood sugar. And quite often you'll see people as they get more fat adapted uh, after you know eating fewer and fewer carbs for longer and longer time periods, they start to get more of this dawn effect and a post exercise effect. Now, if that's happening, uh, I spend more time. I think we, all three of us spend more time talking people down off of a ledge because they've seen that happen and they're getting nervous and the numbers going up to 105, 115, something like that, even 120, maybe 130 uh, during a, a, a long exercise period. I'm not too worried about that. That That's not something that's going to hurt you. It's when it's usually from eating uh, carbs and eating complex carbs like grains where your blood sugar goes up, goes way over 140 and it stays there for hours. That's where the danger is occurring. Mm -hmm. So bottom line, if your glucose is going a little bit high while you're exercising, that's a good thing. You are depleting your glycogen storage. Yep. Getting rid of that uh, accumulated glucose in your liver. Uh, Brooke, Dr. Bruce Patterson recent paper reported finding a spike COVID and the vaccine that spike proteins, I, I guess he's referring to, in non-classical monocytes for 245 days, haven't seen any reports of them on plaque. So it seems like this is an answer to a previous comment from JMAK. Um I don't I don't I don't have something specific to mention about that. Um probably relates to the part of anything on your blood can be on your plaque, maybe. There's a whole chemical process going around into what goes into plaque and what stays on the blood. Uh, Robert Pinsky, after my visit with you, just sent a list of recommended several supplements for different conditions. Could you review those recommendations in a future live event? Yeah, sure. So actually on the on the Dallas event, we're gonna have a full topic covering supplements. So what Robert Pinsky is referring to is we have a list of supplements at a website called Fullscript. And Dr. Brewer reviewed all of those and try to find those that could be applicable to different patients or different conditions uh, as recommendations. The list is not that long because as you have heard here before, even though supplements can be helpful and play a role, lifestyle is king. And it's more about what you do and what you eat rather than the supplements you take. But we know supplements are a very popular topic. They're a big deal. And we have covered a couple of them during the show. So we're, we're very likely covering, a, maybe doing a full show on supplements. Maybe we might need two, talk, two, two shows or three shows to cover all of them. Uh, we'll see. Dr. Brewer? Yeah, I do think we, uh, we keep get, getting reminded. People are very interested in supplements. We, uh, we covered, I think it was Natto a few weeks ago, and we'll be covering it again. And citrulline. Up, citrulline. Uh, We'll be covering NATO again in, a, in an upcoming video. I don't think we're covering citrulline in that video, are we, Jesus? I don't think so. We also are, we have serapeptase and lumbrokinase on the list too. So there are plenty. Uh, ashwagandha is another one that's becoming really popular. So there are, there are a couple of supplements that we know we want to cover. But then you get this piper that says microplastics cause heart attacks and you need to cover it. <laughs> even, even if it's one month later. Yeah. Um, Josh probably had has microplastics too. Maybe. Uh, I, I don't. I don't think he has. He had that much like current sharks on the ocean right now. <laughs> if anybody's eating sharks, you might be concerned concerned about your shark having some microplastics on it. Uh, probably sharks will get more sick of eating humans than than us mm -hmm. eating sharks. Uh, truth ranks. Good morning, Dr. Burgess and Jeannie. I look forward to the pra practical. So, practical. I, I mean, the recommendations we, we said. 
uh, especially on big decisions to telemedicine, uh, feels like here's all info and few convictions. Willing to find out more. I have been telling that Dr. Brewer all the time. Dr. Brewer, you need to take a stance. Are you pro forma or are you uh, anti-establishment? And he doesn't take a stance. He just says, well, it depends. That's his answer all the time. He's in Switzerland. Yeah, That's yeah. right. You know, so, it's it, yeah. it, it, it's interesting. Nobody thinks of uh, Robert Lustig as being um, not taking a stance. He's uh, anti you could say he's anti everything, but it's interesting. He uh, he's very strong on you can be healthy with uh, a carnivore diet. You can be healthy with a vegan diet and you can be healthy with everything in between. He was on Drew Perot's show. Drew was a raw vegan for a while and then gave that up. Uh, raw vegan is hard. And um, he and uh, Lustig was talking about his ancestor, who was the guy. I can't remember his name right now. It, it was the Scandinavian who spent a couple of years in the Arctic Circle mm -hmm. and came home and, and went into the hospital to demonstrate how you could do very, very well in terms of cardiovascular risk, eating nothing but meat, just like they were doing in the Arctic Circle. So. Yep. Uh, I, I know rants and raves uh, create uh, attract eyeballs, but I, I struggle. You know, I try to I try to work up a rant and a rave every now and then, but it's uh, reality tends to be my thing. Well, but, you know, the thing that's good about that, though, I think, is that um, you don't say there's a carte blanche answer for everything. There's specific things that you have to take into account, and that's more important than just saying do this because then people do that, it doesn't work, and then they're just disillusioned where at least we're, you know, testing and helping guide throughout. I, I think that's a better way myself. Well, that's why we don't have that many views, Jeannie. <laughs> People <laughs> like to know the answer. They want there to know sense. what should I do? And a YouTube video should tell me that. You and can't. It, you it, can't. It, that's the lie that everyone's been telling us. No, There's but an maybe answer for it all. We should do something like the liver king. Do you know the liver king? Who that mm -hmm. guy was? The guy that mm -hmm. was eating raw meat all the time, that was jacked up, and then he came out and screamed and said, "Well, I'm just in steroids, and actually, not, <laughs> I don't need all of that." <laughs> yeah, I will. I will fake make it, another... fake, fake it until you make it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I will spoil some more beans, uh, Jesus, and make a couple more comments about diet in this space. So, uh, Nathan, our our uh, YouTube channel guy, is has got using me for a guinea pig. So we did a five day fast. I don't know how much of that we're going to use for a video. I lost 10 pounds. Two weeks later, I gained the 10 back plus four more. But it was actually a good thing because my waist size never got uh, any bigger. Um, I feel much, much better. I, I do feel like I got a real boost in terms of my metabolism. We'll cover that again. Now he, we, he's got me on a, on a carnivore diet. And one of the things that happened, one of the things I'm discovering is there is, I, I've demonstrated before, I thought that you could do well on a carnivore diet, but I never really spent a lot of time as in weeks on it. And one of the things I'm realizing is if you come from a culture that eats processed cereals mm -hmm. um, on a regular basis and, and all this stuff, it's hard to figure out how to do, you know, it, to, it's like, it's like what uh, Miranda talks about with us. She says, forward, it's so difficult when you say glycemic carbs, and that's not very simple. And it's true. It's not very simple. Well, a carnivore diet is very simple. I mean, you, there's not much, uh, there's not much choice you have to make. There's no, there's little to no choice fatigue there. You so just, like in, in a day, what are you eating just for a hemp lay? Well, so um, yesterday for breakfast, I had uh, two eggs and two patty, sausage patties. For lunch, I had ham and uh, sausage. For dinner, I had ham and <laughs> sausage. <laughs> <laughs> and guess what I had for breakfast, Jeannie? Ham and sausage. <laughs> <laughs> so, so no sausage. You basically, I, I ran out of sausage, so I could only have ham. So, so you basically basically went to the store and took away all the ham and sausages, sausages that you can find in there. <laughs> they ran out of sausages, so now I'm living on ham. 
<laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> Oh, well, but uh, you're not you're not including eggs, bacon, stuff like he that. Ate, he you didn't listen. He ate I didn't eggs. have eggs. Oh, oh, I, I didn't, didn't have I eggs didn't today. That. I had oh, eggs okay. yesterday. Oh yeah. So if you go out to eat, you get what? Just a steak and a steak, a steak Damn. and a lobster. <laughs> can, can 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 you eat can you eat pork rinds? Yes, yes. Clearly, pork rinds are part of um, a carnivore diet. For those yep. that don't know what pork rinds, who are, aren't from the deep south U.S., pork rinds are the subcutaneous fat of a pig. Mm -hmm. uh, you They boil it in uh, oil. And what's interesting, most people think, well, it's got to be totally fat. A actually, pork rinds have relatively little fat. They're more protein than fat. Yeah, it's basically the skin of the pig. And as you start talking to experienced carnivores, they'll start saying, yeah, you know, you got to cut out quite eating just pure protein all the time. You got to add a lot more fatty meats and fats there. Yep. Mm, like, like avocado or something. Well, uh, is that, is the, that within is the, that like the, the carnivore avocado diet? Is the, that what you're <laughs> so, so do, the, so carnivores never eat even. Well, that's I mean, another really well, interesting the, the, point. The, the, the we, pure carnivore, maybe not, but Dr. Burr has something to say. Go ahead. <laughs> so, Jesus, do you mind if I spoil the beans on that one? Uh, that's what you do. <laughs> that's my I mean, role. I, I, I stopped trying so far. <laughs> and like, it's there's there's no solution for this. So, so there's what three or four uh, big carnivores that we that are out there on the internet. Um, uh, Eric Berg is not not so much a carnivore, but more of a keto guy. Mm -hmm. uh, Ken Berry, we had on the channel a while back, uh, has is a big carnivore guy. Paul and Saladino he, is the other one. Sean Baker. Oh, Sean I'm Baker, sure, Paul I'm Saladino. Actually, no. I'm actually reading Paul Saladino's book. It's good so far. I'll let you know my take on the end. Well, yeah, go ahead. Well, see, that's the next point. So Paul Saladino says he's a carnivore. He almost is referring more to organ meats than he is to mm -hmm. never eating plants because he clearly eats fruits. And I didn't know that a fruit that eating fruit classified as a carnivore, but a lot mm -hmm. of carnivores do. Yeah. Uh, he Doesn't he also eat salads? He eats some salads. I have seen him eating a lot of fruit, coconut, oranges, apples. So I think he kind of uh, backed up a little bit on the pure carnivore thing. Uh, it's interesting because for, from what I have read so far on his, on his carnivore code book, he is a big fan of that theory that plants have phytochemicals that are actually harming the people who are eating that. I need to go deeper into the evidence because I, can, I, I, need, to, I need to acknowledge I'm a little bit skeptical about that. Uh, I think I think the position about eating vegetables is more not of vegetables are dangerous more than eating protein is not dangerous. Someone so that, said he he calls it animal based now. That's what yeah, someone said. Like yeah. the opposite to plant based, which plant based allows you to eat some some protein and 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 meat from animals too. So yeah. So okay. then we we've got a short coming out that Jesus is working on where. I'm reacting to um, when Ken Berry came on, he talked about eating meat and veg. And veg. if you listen to his videos, I mean, he was talking about that on his recent lab reviews with his and his wife, Nisha's labs. And he made the point that she showed very little inflammation, despite that she had inflammatory disease and despite the fact that she ate veg. So I listened to all of that and I really wonder, so what is carnivore? You know, for a long time, for maybe a few decades, I tended to eat mostly, you know, I traveled a lot. So I had to eat at a lot of restaurants. And so my go-to meal was usually going to be some kind of salad and maybe salmon or uh, some kind of piece of meat. I did not know. I never ever would have classified myself as eating carnivore all those decades. But now that we're getting deeper into what carnivores really call how they define their diets, maybe I was. I had no idea. I would have called it more plant-based because I was mostly eating salads. That's but interesting. Now you, but, but now it's just sausage ham and sausage ham. <laughs> the version, uh, the version so, of so, carnivore so, so, so I'm doing right now doesn't salad. include a lot of salads. So. It's a sausage ham diet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh,
I think that's a really good point. And just uh, just to embarrass you in front of the audience, Dr. Bird, you need to re-record that short. I'm sorry to tell you that. <laughs> it's not good. Later. Uh, yeah, it, it's not it. as. Yeah, I get it. Uh, I, I appreciate your editorial comments. <laughs> yeah, on live, on, live on stage in front of thousands of people. I'm sorry, <laughs> Captain Crouch from Crunchy Arteries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. they should, they oh, should yeah. advertise that. Yeah. You know, speaking of supplements, that that Captain Crunch came up on the Niacin article. Oh yeah. yeah. When they when they talked about uh niacin is dangerous for you, it's causing heart attacks. Yeah, see, in the diet not the article came out about showing that people that had niacin biomarkers in their blood had higher risk for heart attacks. So they're again in a number one journal. What was that? That was uh, nature medicine. That was nature it? medicine, yeah. Really, really high quality journal, and they never dealt with the obvious question. Was that niacin a biomarker for eating grain products which are the number one risk factor for prediabetes and diabetes and it just went right over their head well so, to their credit to their credit they'd say rice wheat and uh another grain product over there so they acknowledge that it's the fortified foods and grain products with niacin that are Oh, I don't remember. At least they acknowledged it. So, but what did they, they do to rule that out? Oh, no, no. They they, they were not able Nothing. to do that because even their they sample, they, they didn't know about the dietary intake of their sample. Yeah. But they did throw punches to niacin supplementation or supplements. So, uh, yeah. Interesting. Anyhow, the whole point is that Captain Crunch is one of the major sources of niacin for people that eat it. It's one of those cereals that's really fortified with niacin. Yep. Uh, yep. What's your bottle of water left in your car? Definitely. Peggy Douglas, we have avoided heating food in plastic and only drink from plastic bottles when it's all that's available. Yeah, sometimes that's all it is. I can tell you, I mean, in Mexico, you oh, anytime you go to a developing country, it's like don't drink the water out of the out of the uh, out of the tap water. That's and, and that's true. You cannot drink that. And I don't think it's kind of a dangerous itself because it's for infections because it actually has a lot of chloride on it. But I cannot tell you it's pure. So we do eat bottled water on those big, we call them garrafones, big water containers, but those are made of plastic. And so developing countries were screwed because you, you cannot drink from the tap water. Yeah, you can't drink either way. Yeah. In fact, I think I'd take my chances with plastic uh, more than, I know I would. If I were to travel to Mexico this week, I would take my chances more with bottled water. Yeah, Dr. Brody keeps saying that he's coming to Mexico. I don't believe him anymore. Uh, for, for at least 20 years because of those warnings, but it's still impossible to avoid all plastics. That's what we're saying. Unfortunately, that's just the way reality is, and Dr. Brewer will check your own reality all the time. Can you, can you avoid microplastics? Eh, you can try. Uh, Alan Turner, unfortunately, I cannot attend to the last event. That's a, that's a bummer. Uh, will a video proceedings, especially concerning supplements, be available on your channel after the event? I don't know if in the channel. Uh, we're working with a big production team right now that are trying to get a quality video of the full thing. So I don't know after that what's going to happen. Dr. Brewer, do you know anything? Uh, yeah, call. I thought we were making it available for sale. I didn't want to say that because I wasn't sure. So uh -oh. I didn't want to. I, I didn't want to promise Maybe something and then spoil the beans. Sports I, I, more beans. I, uh, I, but I, here, I, here's the thing. Call this number, the 859 uh, 714. And they can give you the real answer. Yep. We're, we'll give you our wishes. <laughs> we'll but give they'll give you the real answer. That was my understanding that it was going to be available for sale. Maybe not for the channel, but available for sale. Just so you know, it's a two day event. So we will need like 3,000 YouTube lives to cover all of that. Um, Bill Kearney, aren't the main receptors that stimulate an insulin response in the duodenum? So exercise which breaks down glycogen isn't the same insulin response. Trying to understand the question. So insulin response, insulin receptors on the duodenum. So only what you eat, it's going to spike insulin. Not, not necessarily. I don't think that's the case. Yeah, there are there, there are there are, there are receptors on the in intestine, but there are more yeah. insulin receptors in other places. 
And sooner or later, where the concern is when it hits the blood. Oh yeah, and that's and where the insulin rea reaction is going to be. So you the can you reason. can you can promote insulin secretion by smell, what you eat. Yes, there are some receptors on the duodenum, but there is also a response from glucose in the bloodstream. So it's multiple places, and that's that's the point the point of uh, artificial sweeteners, for example that will make you crave more sugar, not necessarily a spike in your blood insulin or creating an insulin secretion, but it's all part of the same system of signaling. Uh, Dr. Brewer is pro good outcomes. Yeah. Yes. We need to, we need to know how to market, how to do some marketing promotion out of that quote. Uh, I'd love to hear your cover talk of three annals, the, the other vitamin E and especially one source from Anato. I think a supplement called Anado GG really made a difference in my lipid results. Thank you, Peggy. Thank you for mentioning that. We actually are going into the route of uh, maybe covering haptoglobin, haptoglobin 1, 1, 2, 2, if you're familiar with those. And vitamin E is a part of the solution for that. Uh, but there is some research going on that we would like to cover that. And maybe we can touch on vitamin E if, if it comes to that. And lastly, I'm going to go here and say, uh, through drains, thank you. I agree. Each person is individual. That's why I decided to try PrevMed for health determination and plan for me. Info is overwhelming as much as, as much for as against in lots of areas. Yeah. Uh, or I can tell you, our patients end up becoming uh, people who know more about a specific prevention, cardiovascular prevention than the average doctor. That's just the way it is. But you get to that point after a few months or even a couple of years with us because every visit is a learning process for your case and overall prevention. And um, just want to acknowledge JMK. JMK, one of those uh, viewers that hasn't become a YouTube member, she but she's she's all every she or he is every week here with us. So I appreciate that. Uh, she's uh, she, that's the person who made the first comment. Risk factor is not cause and effect. That's true. The puzzle is bigger than just one item. But we know that one of the biggest piece of that puzzle is insulin resistance and metabolic disease. And that's what we're trying to help people uh, solve. Dr. Brewer, closing remarks. We we passed the hour mark, two minutes in. So you failed again. I'm trying. I'm trying the hardest I can. So uh, we had a couple of other, <clears throat> at least one other good question. Uh, one was, what about all the saturated fats in that sausage? Um, <clears throat> saturated fat has been a big, big bugaboo too. You know, I mentioned cholesterol, I mentioned fats, I mentioned, uh, a whole bunch of things that we all thought were killing us because we found them in plaque. The reality is, um, Nina Teicholz is a, uh, um, a good investigative science reporter. And she brought up this whole question about, about saturated fats when she wrote the book big fat surprise. And she brought that into question. There've been not only one, but two really big uh, uh, meta-analyses looking at that question since then. And the meta-analyses are saying, mm, maybe the saturated fat's not the danger we thought it was. Now, neither one of those studies indicated that saturated fat was really good for you, like you would see with uh, maybe a good olive oil or a uh, some of the other oils, but, or omega-3 oils, but, uh, not, not bad for you as so many people still assume. I have a question. Are you wearing your glucometer during this time and are you spiking your blood sugar? Well, uh, y yes and no. I haven't been, I keep thinking I'm going to get a CGM and everybody's disappointed one. in me. I haven't done it, but <laughs> my blood sugars have been nice and low. I did go ahead and get a, um, um, you know, what was interesting, I went low. So I hardly ever spilled ketones. So I went low carb like over a decade ago. And and people that have a good experience, their body has good experience in going low carb, rarely do show ketones in the urine, even though they might be doing doing ketones in the in the bloodstream or the breath. When I did that five-day fast, water fast. At that point, I did ketones. I had never had a significant positive ketone in my urine until then. In days three, four, and five, it just cranked way up to the absolute maximum. 
Some places say that da that's dangerous. I'm not so sure. It, it didn't seem dangerous to me. Anyway, so back to uh, the carnivore diet experience and blood sugar. Yeah, my, my blood sugars have been remaining low. I did get a keto mojo and I got a, another type of thing which measures. Um, so for those of you who don't know, a keto mojo is a, is a blood stick uh, ketone meter. And it also has a glucose meter as well. My blood sugars have remained low. Um, my, uh, even though, so I did it a couple of times where I looked at my urine, my ketones were negative and I looked at breath and blood and my ketones were positive, meaning that, yep, my, I've got a body that's very experienced in fat burning. And so what it's doing is it's burning the amount that it knows that that I can burn as opposed to the amount that I'm going to be peeing out. So uh, I know you, um, are you going to repeat labs just to see if any kidney function was affected? I did. I repeated, uh, last, what last week. And then we're planning on doing this for like three weeks, four weeks, if I can stand it. And actually if I can stand it, I'm being silly. It, it it's a very easy diet for me. Um, Somebody else asked, well, why aren't you eating uh, fatty meats rather than just ham? Because ham was the easiest to get. <laughs> I did get some roast beef and I'm enjoying that, but ham has been nice and easy. And, you know, these big blocks, you know, they keep saying uh, ribeye and, and pork shoulder, well, not pork shoulder, but ribeye and things and lick large fatty cuts of cow are the thing that experienced carnivores eat. And that may be true. I'm just a junior baby carnivore and ham's easier. So. Well, all for it. Well, I'm, 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 I'm getting more and more convinced that I should try it. I mean, I do eat a lot of meat. Uh, I, I'm, I'm probably on a similar space where Dr. Brewer was on the keto board, but I, pr I probably eat a little more, more of carbs. It's just kind of a cultural and social issue. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm very tempted to try it just like Dr. Brewer is. Probably I will not tolerate ham and sausages every day, but I'll try to mix mm -hmm. it with something else. Um, but I'm, I'm just going to leave this. I leave it like a subliminal message for Dr. Brewer. Cancun or Guanajuato work the best. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> we should try it. That's actually a good idea. That well, and Costa Rica. We you Get your oar in the water. Yep. Guanajuato, well, Cancun. Perfect. All right. Well, uh, we'll see you next week, guys. We have uh, we have some interesting guests for future shows that we're having on the list. But I haven't told Dr. Brewer so he doesn't spoil the beans. You don't want him to spoil your beans? He spoiled no. all the beans. I'm I would like to ask, can you actually spoil beans? I think so. That's natto. That's what I was getting ready to say. What do you think natto is? <laughs> spoiled beans? Bac Bacillus subtilis spoiled uh, soybeans. And it actually is good for you. Yep. Okay. So spoiling right. the beans is good for everybody, I guess, right? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> not not for the YouTube channel, but yes. Sure. Okay. Well, anyway, we're digressing. See you next week, guys. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>